if you were to open your computer and you were to look at a uh, Google image search of Jesus, you would come across a wide array. There is um, a plethora of images of Jesus, and they're all quite different. There are depictions of Jesus that really play up his masculinity, right? Jesus has um, obscenely huge muscles. Comic book illustrations of the Bible often do this, right? Jesus in these illustrations often appears shirtless. Sometimes his shirt is like torn in two. Um, his muscles are in a perpetual state of flexing. Even on the cross, Jesus has chiseled abs and bulging biceps. And there's a particular point to this, right? Jesus is the hero. He is the one who is strong and mighty. He is the, the victor who can subdue anything. And so these illustrations of Jesus, it is based on human understandings of strength, right? The bigger the muscles, the stronger you are. And so Jesus just has obscenely big muscles. This is opposite to depictions of Jesus, which highlight his compassion. In these images, Jesus is often quite fair-looking. Uh, sometimes he is almost effeminate. He is often surrounded by images of vulnerability, uh, sheep or children or sometimes women. And the point here is that Jesus is the one who is caring. He is the supreme comforter. He is the support for our lives. Now, why... Talk about all this. Well, you know, let me ask you a question. What image of Jesus do you have? If I were to ask you to close your eyes and picture Jesus, what image would pop into your mind? That's in some sense what Jesus is doing in our gospel when he asks the disciples, you know, what people understand him to be. Who do people say that I am, Jesus asks. Who do people see me to be? What image do they have of me? But of course, that's not his main concern because he presses to ask the more important question. And what about you? Who do you see that I am? It's a question that we need to all ask ourselves. Because that question, how do we see Jesus? How do we image Jesus? Who do we confess Jesus to be? That has profound impact on how we live our Christian lives. If you want to follow along, I invite you to pick up the Gospel of Mark. So Jesus is walking around the villages of Caesarea Philippi, where he asks these questions. And there's a couple of interesting dynamics here. For one, the area of Caesarea Philippi, it was a place which was dedicated to Caesar. So in this area, there was this huge temple advocating that Roman proclamation that Caesar is Lord. So it's interesting, or at least I find it interesting, that the conversation about Jesus' lordship and what it means occurs against the backdrop of this Roman proclamation. So the disciples respond that some think that Jesus is John the Baptist, some think that he's Elijah, some think he's another prophet. And I always chuckle at this because these are not easier options. In fact, I would say that it would take more faith to believe that Jesus is the reincarnated presence of the beheaded John the Baptist than to believe that he is the enfleshment of God on earth. But sometimes we see this, and we see this even in life today. People will sometimes believe the most outlandish things. And sometimes the most outlandish things about God or about Jesus, which actually take more faith, which actually is more of a stretch of logic than to believe that Jesus is actually the enfleshment of God on earth that the Bible is actually accurate and historically reliable. Sometimes we see this even today. But Jesus really isn't interested in just a report on how people view Jesus. It can be interesting. Um, and we can scratch our heads, but that's not his main point here. The main question is, and what about you? Who do you say that I am? Jesus is emphatic. I want to know what you think. See, our understanding of Jesus just can't be based on what other people see him to be. Uh, this, there has to be a personal connection. Now, there are times where we're growing in faith, where we can say, you know what, I'm going to be carried on by the community. And it's okay that, you know, I might not understand all of this, but the community 
um, accepts this and believes this, so I'm just going to follow the community. And that can be okay to a degree. Because at one point, for each and every single one of us, there will come the question, and what about you? What do you think? Who do you say that I am? How do you see Jesus in your life? That's the question Jesus is asking Peter and the disciples. So Peter pipes up and he responds with the confession that Jesus is the Christ. You are the Messiah, he says. Now this is a loaded term. To say that Jesus is the Christ is to say that Jesus is the one who is anointed by God to save the people. So Peter is saying, you are the Savior. You are the epicenter of God's activity on earth. You are the fulfillment of all that God has promised us. This is the heart of Christian confession. This is the heart of Christian faith. This is the heart of Christian proclamation. This is what it means to confess that Jesus is Lord. Have you ever thought about what it means for Jesus to be the Christ uh, for you? Or when we say the creed, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ. What do you mean by that? What is, the, what is the content behind that proclamation? How does the lordship, how does the Christship of Jesus influence your life? Because Christ is not just Jesus' last name. It declares who he is, and it declares what he came to do. And how we live our Christian lives is predicated on how we understand Jesus as Messiah, as Christ, as Lord. Case in point. Peter's proclamation. Because when Peter says that Jesus is the Christ, he is, and, and while in some sense he's correct, in some sense he's not. Because he has in mind something very particular. He is imaging Jesus as that comic book strongman. Right? He's the military ruler. Jesus is the one, he was the Christ who will be the mighty king. He will trample the enemies of Jesus. He will be political. He will he will be kind of this national ruler. So when Jesus begins to unfold what it means to actually be the Christ, to suffer, to be killed, to rise again, it doesn't compute to Peter. He can't accept it. It doesn't fit into his scheme. It makes no sense. And so Peter addresses Jesus and deals with Jesus, not on the basis of who Jesus said he was, but on how Peter assumes Jesus should be. So he takes Jesus aside, but still in earshot of everybody else, and he rebukes him. Now don't miss this. This is not a polite questioning of what Jesus said. This is not a loving request that Jesus reconsider what is to come. Peter takes Jesus aside. He assumes a voice of authority over him. And he tells Jesus, you are wrong. Because he is basing everything on his human understanding of what it means to be the Christ. Rather than on what Jesus reveals the Christ to be. Have you ever told Jesus that he's wrong? Have you ever told Jesus, you, you must be mistaken? Right? Jesus might ask us to forgive someone, and then we say, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't think you actually meant that. Even though Jesus asks how we image him, who do people say that I am, and who do you say that I am, how do we see him? Even though Jesus asks that, the main point of this is that it's not up to us to dream up a response. Jesus discloses himself. How we see Jesus should be based on who Jesus has shown himself to be in our lives. We are not asked to come up with some definition ourselves. We are not asked to come up with some fancy new understanding. We are not asked to dream up some culturally relevant implication. We are asked to accept who Jesus reveals himself to be. Because he's clear. He's clear about who he is. He's clear about what he is to do. In our gospel reading, he declares, you know, the Son of Man must suffer, he must be killed, he must rise. And then it says, he spoke plainly about these things. He let it be known, this is what's going to happen, this is what has to happen. 
When we read the Gospels, there is very little wiggle room when it comes to who Jesus is, when it comes to what he did, when it comes to how he died and how he raised. Jesus asked Peter and the disciples, Jesus asks us to confess that Jesus is the Christ, yes, but he is the Christ of the cross. He is the Lord, yes, but he is the Lord who lays down his life. And the reason that this is important is that the Lord that we confess is the Lord that we follow. Let's see that again. The reason this is important is because the Lord that we confess is the Lord that we follow. The Christ that we embrace is the Christ that we journey with. So if we believe that Jesus is just a prophet, right? Like some people of the day and probably some people still today then we might like his words, but we're not going to look for his presence in our lives because prophets die, right? We might take his words with us, which is good in its own right. And we might have moments where we think, okay, Jesus says, just turn the other cheek, or Jesus says, forgive, you know, and that's, that's fine, but we're not going to search out his spirit in our lives. We're not going to look for some divine encounter or where Jesus might show up in our lives. If we view Jesus as Lord, but as the uber-muscular Lord who can still flex victoriously on the cross, then we might assume that struggles or hardships in our lives is lack of faith. We might assume that if the Lord was truly with us, we might say, we should be enjoying abundance and victory over every single problem. Because after all, Jesus has bulging muscles and can do this. If you follow a Lord that did not die on the cross, then there's a Lord who did not raise from the dead. So we follow a Lord who has nothing to say or nothing to offer to the depths of human need. And we will never open ourselves to that presence. The Lord we confess is the Lord that we follow. Jesus is honest about himself going to the cross. Son of man must suffer. He must be killed. It's interesting he says must, right? He must suffer, he must be killed, and he will be raised from the dead. And then Jesus calls everybody to himself and he says, if anyone would come after me, they must deny themselves, they must take up the cross and follow me. To confess that Jesus is Lord is to place our feet in his steps. It is to journey to the cross. It is to take up our cross and carry it right behind him. Right? And so, to confess that Jesus is Lord, to confess that he is the Christ, is to follow Jesus to the cross. And it can mean only that. This is what Jesus is saying. Take up your cross and follow me. Now, sometimes we take this phrase and we blow, out, blow it way out of proportions. Either we minimize it, and we say that every uh, minor annoyance in life is, quote, our cross to bear, no. I'm sorry, your annoying uncle is not your cross to bear. Right? That splinter you got in your hand, it is not your cross to bear. Similarly, we can go too far. Right? We can blow it too far the other way. We can assume that our cross has to be this dour, self-condemning look by which we shun all happiness and joy in our lives. Right? To take up the cross is simply just to recognize um, the continual call to uh, self-effacement. No. To take up your cross is to take up those low places of our lives and to recognize that God's power works in those places and sometimes through those places. It is to shun visions of success that this world puts forward, visions of might, visions of strength, visions of um, riches and, and having everything work out. It is to follow Jesus' example of love and mercy and grace. And sometimes, yes, it means that we bear a certain amount of pain. To take up your cross was to bear a certain amount of pain, to bear a certain amount of rejections, and that might be revealed in our lives as well. But we do so always keeping our eyes upon Jesus, the one who carries his cross before us. What good is it, Jesus says, 
to gain the whole world, but to forfeit your soul. And that word means damage. To damage your soul. What gain is it? Right? What gain is it? To gain the whole world. To have everything at your fingertips. But lose your soul. So to carry your cross is to nourish your soul. In connection with Jesus. And to see that as more important than any glistening bauble that the world can throw at us. So how are you confessing Jesus as Lord? Are you open about your love for him? About Jesus being your Lord, your Savior, the one who redeems you, the one who heals you, the one who cares for you, the one who strengthens you? Do you allow the Spirit of Jesus to interact with you in all areas of your life? Now, if you are someone who maybe is unsure about what it means to confess that Jesus is Lord, then take a little time and read the Gospels. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But read not just to parse the details, read not to argue with Jesus or rebuke him, but read in order to receive Jesus as he reveals himself, because he's very plain about these things. As you pick up the Bible, ask Jesus to reveal himself. But remember, the one that we confess is the one that we follow. So how do you follow Jesus? in the example he set, and who he revealed himself to be. Right? Jesus cared for the poor and the hungry. How do you do that? Jesus ministered to the sick. Do you do that? Jesus took up children in his arm and he blessed them. Are you? Jesus withdrew to a quiet place to pray. How often do you do that? Jesus lived amid fellowship with his fellow disciples. Are you active in Christian community? Jesus forgave. He acted peaceably. He embraced the wayward. He offered love to the broken. Are these things part of your life? How is the life of Jesus being revealed in your life? How is the love that took Jesus to the cross expressed in the love that you exude as you take your cross and follow him? May our confession that Jesus is Lord. Not just be something we say, but be evidenced in our lives, and may the actions of our lives point to the presence of Jesus as our Lord. Amen.